Hi, everybody. It's Katherine Zeisner coming to you virtually all the way from Spokane, Washington, and beautiful Washington State, United States. And I know a lot of you know who I am and have seen me at Connect before. I'm a very proud Canadian uh, principal from the Thames Valley District School Board in London, Ontario. But now I am a professor at Gonzaga University. Um, welcome to um, my short little 35 minute presentation on ensuring aligned priorities in our educational new realities. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. First, if you have any questions during this session, please ask them in the Q&A section down there. And um, I encourage you to ask them as they come up through the session and you can send those over um, on your screen and, and putting those into the window. I'm just reading what they told me to say. Um, and the team will be responding to those in real time. Secondly, Please note that you'll have access to this session on demand through the conference portal. And finally, this session is being closed captioned, um, so you can turn on that feature button in, in your media player. I do talk quickly. I only have 35 minutes and I have so much that I want to say and share, but welcome and I really appreciate you joining me today. Um, if you know me, you know that um, my sessions are usually a little bit different than other people's sessions that I like to be out in front and I like to be animated. So this has actually been hard for me to come up with a way to try and be an engaging in an online platform, but we're going to do it. Um, what I've decided to do is to create more of a tool. So the PowerPoint and this discussion is more of a tool for you as school leaders, no matter what role you're in. I always see people as school leaders, no matter what role you're in, to be able to start those really critical conversations that need to be happening long before September ever comes. And I know you're already hearing all kinds of conversations about what our new reality may look like. And I get it. There's all kinds of safety things that need to be in place. I don't want to talk about the safety things. There's people that are going to do that for us. I want to talk about the social emotional pieces. I want to talk about the learning pieces. And so today's agenda, which is our next slide, that this particular session though is going to discuss our current realities of today's educators through a consolidation of experiences from some of my Canadian US and international friends that I reached out to because my experience here as an online professor during this whole situation is very different than what was actually happening in schools. And so I did the right thing. I asked my friends. I said, what's happening? What's going on? What are your opinions? And um, I want them to be able to. I've got their voices for you to be able to see and hear and to talk about. And then more importantly, the last part of the presentation is a variety of tools and discussion points that I want you to use um, to take back to wherever you are working, whatever educational organization you're in, so you can have a different kind of conversation other than the ones that are about the safety and that kind of stuff. Let's think about specifically though, what do we need to carry forward that we've actually been doing in education? What do we need to stop doing? And what can we start doing in order to prepare our students to have um, quite possibly a very different looking world and educational experience um, in their communities? Now, you're going to see my eyes shifting. I'm talking to you on my laptop, but I have my phone over here with my timer going so I don't go over 35 minutes and I have the PowerPoint presentation over here. So if you see my eyes wandering, please don't think that I'm not feeling well. I'm just trying to make sure that I hit all the really important points. Our agenda is four parts for the next couple minutes. I'm going to set the stage about what our current reality is. I'm going to show you just a, one little slide on data, which was overwhelming to me. Um, I'm going to share with you what my friends who I reached out to, the voices in the field shared, and then those discussion points and tools at the end for you to fly with. And then, of course, we have to talk about the lobster. So let's get started. This particular document that you're looking at right now is from, of course, our educational guru, Michael Fullen and friends, and it was just released. And when I was asked to do this presentation and I found this document, I thought this is what we need. This is the tool we need. So I hope that you download it and you it's not a very long document, but it is very powerful with some very powerful graphics and I've pulled some pieces from it for today. Um, so I'm just sort of highlighting the document and, and bringing some other pieces together. But to me, this is your starting point. If you have to read something this summer, please read this document and make some highlights on it to see how it would um, impact and be part of a useful tool for you in your educational place. It's my favorite cartoon ever. I share it all the time. People constantly in education, especially they're coming to us as educational leaders saying, please change this, please change that. And we ask, well, who wants change? 
often on our stop start continue meetings that we have when the school year starts or at the end of the year when we're doing our reflection. But then when we ask who wants to change, a lot of people have a hard time with that. And we are asking people to change. We did ask people to change. We ourselves have to and have had to change and that's OK, but it's been hard. So I just want to reflect for a second on how change has actually affected many of us. Um, considering the following realities on this particular slide, um, a lot of our families, we don't know how it's affected them. We weren't in their home. They didn't reach out to us during this whole situation. Um, they didn't have the technology available um, or their lives had to continue on in a very confusing way um, while we were still trying to keep that educational agenda going. And so I want us to remember when we're thinking about what some people went through, especially our students, you know, unless we had a chance to reach out and ask them some specific um, through some specific surveys, we won't truly know. Um, I think we've also seen people being their best selves and actually them not best selves. And that's OK, too, because again, we're going to reflect on that as reflective practitioners, which is so important to us um, through this particular difficulties. People were not their best selves. Um, I certainly saw some heroes rise above people supporting students, reaching out, visiting homes, going to their homes, getting food prepared, getting resources to them. But we also saw some students and families who truly struggled um, with a variety of really serious things. Um, what and how did you ask people for what they needed? I know that technology was provided to students, but let's put the school year aside for a second. What are we going to do now to ask them what they need? What are they going to be doing this summer in order to prepare for a new reality? I've spent a lot of time um, talking to new teachers and teachers about um, I want them to do three things over the summer, um, some physical activities, some mental activities and some emotional activities, um, physical stuff, because we all know that it's critical uh, in our roles as educators to stay physically well. It's a very demanding physical role um, from our backs to our necks to our feet. And so ensuring that we're still exercising, um, getting proper rest and food is really important, but also that fact about that mental break that we all need to take, whether people meditate, um, they go out into nature, um, but having the opportunity to address our minds and settling them down, what are we doing to offer that to our staff and our students? And then last, lastly, that emotional piece. People are very emotional right now, that bittersweet piece about the school years come to an end, but I've missed my kids and it didn't end the way it normally does. And all of those things need to be talked about or by the time the fall comes, they're still going to be bubbling there for us, which will make the fall even more difficult. So I encourage you to reach out to your communities and to your staff to say, make sure you're remaining physically active, make sure you're maintaining some mental well-being and make sure you're addressing those emotional pieces through reflective journals or talking to other people or um, uh, reaching out to a counselor. So those those are our current realities of what this change has done for people. And uh, the word on this slide that's I think the most important is the fact it's been dynamic and not dynamic in a woo -woo, fantastic way. It's the fact that it changed minute to minute in some districts. It changed hour to hour for some students and teachers, not to mention day to day and week to week, and it's continuing to. So how can we help people try and find that middle line? Because it has been a little manic for people. So through that physicality, that mental preparation and that emotional ability, um, we want to get people to be here. So by the time we get to that new sense in the fall, we're prepared. We're prepared in all three of those triangles. So where are we? Love this. This comes from the blog on the Microsoft on the Microsoft site. They identified that this whole situation has really looked in uh, looked at as in three phases. This this idea of this disruption. We all know that all of a sudden um, things had to stop, start, continue in a different way. Then we had to transition to a new navigation of teaching, a new navigating of leading, a new navigation of learning. Um, but let's get to the last piece, the reimagining. This is our opportunity. And I don't want to say our opportunity to fix because then I'm assuming something's broken, but this is our opportunity to try 
to try and look at things from a very different perspective. This is why at the end I've given you these reflective tools because in fact there were some real highlights that came from this experience. There were some children that thrived through this. The social anxiety of coming to school was completely taken out of their lives and there they are available to be at home and engage one on one, which a lot of children like through technology, which a lot of students like. Um, so we don't want to miss out on the reimagining of the possibilities based on some real successes. And I know that you've been journaling all and celebrating and sharing some wonderful things that you have discovered. And when I share the voices in the field, there are some things that the uh, my friends have shared too. So we're in the phase three now. We're in the reimagining phase, so let's move past the, the disruptions and let's get to the reimagining and this idea of anything is possible. All right, moving on. So Michael Fullen in this particular book talks about um, what this has truly done for the world. And when I show you the slide on the data, billions of people were affected by this situation. Can you imagine billions? Billions of people. I never thought about it until I saw his slide that um actions have led it's that idea of for every action is an equal option reaction holy smokes billions of people were affected but that means billions of people were available to um to help and to and to be able to provide and be able to meet people's needs and he's talked about the fact that this has given us a chance to address global competencies and you know i'm a huge competency fan that idea of um when you identify a competency and you're not 100 percent sure if you have that particular competency that you look at your knowledge skills and attitude towards it what are the knowledge you have about it what are the skills you have towards it and what's your attitude towards it and such a simple way to help students parents, communities see if it, they're functioning well. Do we have the capacity and the competency to do A, B and C? Well, what do we know about it? What are the skills we have associated with it? And what's our attitude towards it? So I love this particular quote because Michael Fullen talks about that we truly shifted to being learner centered. I've often said, can we stop focusing so much on teaching and let's focus on learning? Just like I say to leaders, can we move from managing to leading it's a it's a it's a very big shift but it's but it's an important and critical shift and that mr fullen dr fullen tells us that through the technology education has been able to do that with purpose and meaning how wonderful is that that we've been able to take this crisis and i'll call it a crisis um to be able to get to being learner centered and i know so many of you already do that but we need to get everybody doing that so this particular slide is a picture that's in that um, book, uh, in that pamphlet by Dr. Fullen. And I just love it because I didn't realize that not every country had school had wide had all wide closures. I thought every country just shut down and every kid stayed home. I didn't realize that. So I love this particular graphic because it shows in the different colors. So the um, in the bright pink and I'm colorblind, so I'm just sort of imagining because it looks like bright pink and um, <laughs> my friend says bright pink um, said that uh, they had localized shutting down and it being here in the States. I, that is true. Some places deferred shutting down and some didn't then countrywide, which is all the purple where this, that's it. The whole the whole country just shut down. You can see Canada's on there, South America, all of Africa looks like a lot of Europe, that kinds of stuff, India. Mexico and then some countries remained open. I can see that Greenland remained open and some small ones like that. Um, but 1.2 billion people affected. 73% almost 73% of enrolled learners. Think about that. 73% of our students in the world were affected by this that for months there was they were missing out. Potentially again on poten potential because I know that people work their butts off to be able to provide um and, but that's a lot of kids that's a lot of people that were affected that was a lot of teachers who um didn't get an opportunity to um do what they wanted to do i know that my husband who's a grade eight teacher um was so disappointed about not having a big year on trip and a graduation and all the wonderful opportunities to recognize kids through awards so i just thought this was a great talking tool um, for people who didn't have that worldwide view um, i think it's a, this is our chance to look at a worldwide view um, if anything, I would hope that this would take us out of our local context and have us looking at a bigger context and not just our own district, our province or state or country, but the worldview. And so I just wanted to highlight this particular thing that lots of people were affected in a variety of ways. 
All right, so let's hear from my friends. So of course, when I had this opportunity to talk about what was the reality and what do I think needs to happen moving forward, I reached out to my masters and doctoral students and friends here at Gonzaga and asked them this question. I said, what do we need to carry forward, stop doing and start doing in order to prepare students for possibly a very different looking world and educational experience? And then I said, what priorities do we need to bring forward um, now that we have so much richer perspective on what home support looks like impacting student learning? And as someone who teaches leadership and community and understanding um, how critical that triangular piece of school, student and, and family is, this gave us a real lens to look at that home support from. So I heard back from the most wonderful of people. So let me just show you some of their comments and some of their um, statements. Before I do that, again, one of my favorite visuals. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but this is kind of where we're coming from. This has been a big elephant and everybody has been touching the elephant in a different place and is assuming it's something a little bit different. But I thought if I was to be able to give you the perspectives of a superintendent director, some principals, some teachers and some international leaders together, we might be able to see the elephant. So let me show you the parts of the elephant from my friends and please Please talk about this visual with your colleagues. I think it really is a, a fascinating perspective on um, how the world works and especially in education when families come to see us and they're bringing their lens and we have our lens and the teacher has their lens. Um, but if we all are together, we get to see the whole elephant. So let's hear from my friend um, Ben Fernie, who's the superintendent of Valley District here out um, just north of Spokane. He, um, it's a beautiful district, very rural, not a lot of kids had access tech to, to technology, but he still found a fantastic way to reflect on his experience of leading from the top, as he describes, um, from that superintendency role or a director role here in the States. And he said kids are amazing. And he said the amount of information they're able to process and the level which they're able to do it has been unparalleled. And I think that's the, the word I'd want to take from Ben's slide. This has been unparalleled. I don't think any of us have ever experienced anything like this before, um, especially in our realities in North America, but there, of course, there has been some um, very large tragedies in other countries, and I know that maybe we should be reaching out to those fantastic people who've experienced it and are bringing forward fantastic experiences for us. But in Ben's case, it has been unparalleled as a person who's only ever worked in the States. Um, he spent a lot of time removing barriers. The, the barriers for him was access to technology for his rural students um, and that he feels the data that they collected from that now is going to really change the fall for them. Um, giving access, um, uh, offering uh, Wi-Fi um, in the parking lot of some of their school facilities for people to access um, was something that they never even thought about what we were able to do and it really changed the support kids were able to provide. And um, I love the fact that even as the head of this, he realizes maybe state assessment data isn't necessarily the most important data to be looking at right now. So a very humble and intelligent leader who is able to look at the fact that um, students are amazing and the data they need to look at in order to support moving forward might not be those, those state tests. My next friend, an elementary principal uh, here in Spokane, Washington, Trish Campert, phenomenal, uh, working at Regal Elementary. Um, interesting, her very first line, again, back to that state assessment, they didn't give the state assessment and everybody's still okay. Um, and with an overwhelming focus on accountability, curriculum mapping, testing, and instructional minutes, they discovered their kids don't love learning because that was their focus. Back to that idea of focusing on teaching instead of learning. And again, through her phenomenal leadership with her team, they were able to come to that reality. So they felt that they should arguably be able to change the way that the student needs to be at the center of all of their planning and that the joy now in learning comes from imagination, creation, attempting, failure, trying and persevering. What a wonderful set of learning skills that they now could be providing for their children who are coming from some tough situations, um, but still have that beautiful spark that we all want from kids and we don't want them to lose it. Um, Interesting, her line says that she's used to kids having adults telling them what to learn and what to do, and that they started to lose some of that curiosity. Um, and that she says that heavy lifting is deceiving. Um, from the perspective of what we felt was important before, not necessarily important now. I love that. Complete change of 
perspective. And there's so many positives we can take from that. And I love the fact that Principal Trish has been able to say that to us. Um, so in her particular situation, she's saying, you know, I don't have to do schedules and modules and stuff like that now. But the idea is how do we get kids to experience the joy of learning again? They might have lost it a little bit or they didn't have it in the first place. And um, they're excited as a school team to try and design a model for that. So thank you, Trish. Now, Canadian Elementary School Principal, my wonderful friend Kira up in Lethbridge, Alberta, responded to my request. And she talked about the fact that we need a shift. That idea of transforming, that idea of reimagining, like our three stages. Um, and a shift from work and learning, and the idea of experience and research and experimental learning, which we absolutely love. So many curriculums now are allowing us to do that and the idea of being supported through technology, not led by technology, but supported. I would highlight the word supported, the fact that it can be aligned with. Um, and we all know that using tools and apps and programs to support the learning will enhance, um, but professional development educators need to get out of their comfort zones. So this is a principle that's saying, you know what? We can do this, but it's going to be uncomfortable, kind of like our lobster. When the lobster starts to feel uncomfortable, it's time to shed its shell. So she asked some questions to her staff. She says, what can we take to look that we learned about ourselves? So again, being a reflective practitioner, those are my favorite words. How can we shift process from product? I love that saying. Um, how do we continue to engage and support through the use of technology? not led by technology. So again, that parallel piece. And what do we need to re redefine as student success? Are marks and grades and assessments student success? Or is it kindness and caring and citizenship and leadership? So thank you, Principal Kira, for giving us those wonderful reflective pieces. U.S. teacher, this is my friend Nikki, who works here in Spokane at a fantastic school um, for children, uh, for, high for high school kids, and she teaches literacy. Her experience was varied because she had graduating students and at one point she even says she liked the drive bright graduations. All, all that hoopla that we used to do taken away and made more family oriented. So again, this is her perspective. She's touching the elephant in a different place. And to her, the grandiose event that we used to do not necessarily was as fantastic as what she experienced from these, the, the she says the drive through graduations are a must to be carrying forward. This less stuffy, more personable, allowing families a front row seat to their child's accomplishments. These types of celebrations were a beautiful symbol of the way the world of education should be, a blending of home and school support. So while she gives us all kinds of great stuff about grades, I felt that that piece about uh, graduation was really interesting to reflect on for a second, because we all thought that that walking across the stage and getting that Facebook photo was so critical but in her case she really appreciated seeing the one-on-one -on -one or small family celebratory pieces don't get me wrong i love walking across the stage and and shaking kids hands and being the principal to do that but i love the fact that she was able to see the important piece of that homeschool connection all right let's talk to my friend carolyn who's up in uh, just outside of calgary and she talks about the fact that it's a transition and I love the fact that she says that we're transitioning from our emergency learning environment. What a fantastic way to think about what she just experienced. An emergency learning environment. So much positivity in that. The fact that she knew she still needed to engage and create a learning environment, but not necessarily was it ideal because it was done in some cases very, very quickly. Um, and that she immediately gets to the idea of the social emotional supports that are so important to us that the positive mental health supports and coping strategies for stakeholders she's not just saying students but there are parents who needed it there are teachers who need it there are administrators who needed it there were community members so many people in the community who didn't get a chance coaches who suffered because they didn't get a chance. All those wonderful museums who didn't get kids to come. There are people in our community who have missed children and missed all those pieces associated with education on an annual basis. And we need to talk about those. She also loved the fact that looking at what wellness must, must look like and our own barriers and struggles that we had to determine 
And she, like the former teacher talks about, what does success really look like to kids now? Um, she, what, I, what I like is her last sentence where she talks about she wanted to appreciate her own prop practice and the opportunities that she had to create different kinds of relationships. And in some cases, those relationships really thrived. Some cases, some kids appreciated the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and, and she even says some of the kids that wouldn't engage in a regular classroom were able to engage online. So again, finding those positives, finding those success stories. And she says her major takeaway is now intentionally the use of a virtual platform to create more sustainable and personal connections with a diverse learner. I look at that as alignment of technology with current practice. Let me say that again. Alignment of technology with our current practice, supporting all learners. Yes. I was the learner who liked the fitness, just like now. I, this is tough for me. I want to be in front of you. I want to be able to see and, and I don't want to touch you, see and feel you as an audience. But I do recognize there are some people that this works for because we're all sitting in our pajama bottoms with our slippers on, aren't we? I hope so, because I am. And I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed that. I'm not going to lie. Um, and there are some kids and teachers who've enjoyed that too. Um, now, International School Principal. This is my friend Anne Marie Lewis, who's the principal of the Canadian um, International School of Beijing. Can you imagine? She's the principal in Beijing, China. And uh, as a phenomenal leader with a phenomenal team, she was able to identify with us of the some unbelievable assessment strategies that they were able to use. And with such a diverse school community with so many multilingual learners, um, lots of academic challenges. Uh, happened, but her team was able to um, meet together to meet a lot of those needs. And so she was able to talk about how her teachers went above and beyond, not just in learning, but in those personal connections in their own personal lives, and that it's provided a lot of personal and professional growth for her staff. So the hurt particular takeaway is the fact this allowed her staff to grow. They met the needs of the students but allowed for her staff to be able to truly develop. And what an honor for all of us to have our staff have opportunities to grow. She says, we've reflected on what it will take moving forward from this crisis, knowing that we no we're no longer the teachers we used to be. And the needs of our students, families, and communities are different. Let me say that again. The needs of our students and families and communities are different. So we cannot go back to what we were doing because it's that idea of the insanity. If we keep doing what you've always done, expecting the same result, um, things are different. So we do need to use that stage of reimagination. Last voice from the field. This is my beautiful friend in Singapore, who is the head of student support and well-being at a school in Singapore, Colleen Dresner. Um, she found the positives. The, this was a great conversation that I had with her her husband, who's a school um, psychologist there. And the fact that for many of their learners, school was anxiety inducing and that some of their learners thrived in remarkable ways because they could show up in a different way. Fit, you know, physically showing up versus having a presence. And I was so happy to hear that her learners were able to thrive um, and that they were able to pinpoint and what they've learned about every learner. And so they've developed these stories about their learners. So they know their learners even better now. So imagine when they come back together, now they're that idea of Rita Pearson's champion for every student. They've already got it at that school in Singapore. So I'm feeling very positive. Okay, I only got five minutes left and that's okay because I just want to show you some tools and I want you to steal them because um, they come from Dr. Fuller and they come from Anne Marie Luce's school. So these are some tools and discussion points that I want you to use as a school team when you're with your community and all of your stakeholders. Please, not just you, not just your teachers, maybe even reach out to some of your student leaders, but here are some really great tools. So first of all, a Venn diagram um, on the reflective pieces about what are the three main places you need to look at for your reimagination, safety, well-being, and learning. And in this particular case, on the left-hand side, it gives you all those questions to ask. Gathering this information now to be able to fill it into this so you can see what do you need to stop, start, and continue? It's really that simple. What do you need to stop, start, and continue? What worked, what didn't work? What are some pieces moving forward that truly led to student learning? And some of the questions they asked here were about, you know, what was good to pause? What were some things that we were doing in schools 
that we probably needed to pause. Now, let me, just a little side for a second. I'm on TikTok, for those who don't know, I'm absolutely addicted to it and I love it. I'm Dr. Zeisner on TikTok. And I did a really funny video on school theme days where one day I dressed up in 20 different costumes. Maybe there's a few too many theme days. Maybe that's taking away from the learning environment. I don't know, but maybe this would be the opportunity for you as a school to look at the interruptions that are happening through exterior events that are taking away from the learning. And this tool, and again, this is just a series of sheets and tools I wanna to share with you, may give you a chance to look and address some of those things. All right, let's look at another one. Um, I love this. Again, email this out to people and ask these questions. What are some of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes our students need to be able to thrive? So forward thinking, um, needs-based, uh, what kind of learning do they need? And if you need a really good document to reflect on, Microsoft has my favorite document, as you know, it's called the Class of 2030, um, that has all kinds of data and fantastic information in it to help you take a look at what the Class of 2030 needs. Who are now, now sitting in grade two and about to move into grade three, holy smokes. And it's all of these kinds of things. And talking about remote learning, talking about well-being, talking about what can we do to leverage kids' futures. So again, some questions to ask yourself, your stakeholders, record these, put them into a chart, share them out widely and then start to focus on what's really critical for you. This is full of uh, uh, competencies. I love this. Character, citizenship, collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. And what I like about his six competencies, everybody can do these. We Everybody can grow and, and have a better character everyone can demonstrate citizenship. When I was um, the vice principal of a school in London, Ontario, uh, it was the first, I was there the first year we had a graduating class and we completely transformed the way we did grade eight graduation awards away from the subject specific awards because that really limited the number of kids that could accomplish and earn that to this kind of award. Anybody could win the character award, anybody could demonstrate that citizenship and, and be recognized with that award. And I just thought, wow, you could really take a look at what you're offering in your school and how you offer it by looking at these competencies. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, we're good. Um, so this is in the full in document. It's a variety of pages that they have provided. That's a checklist. And things I never even thought about moving forward. And I'm not talking hand sanitizer and masks. I'm literally talking about the way that schedules and people and buildings and spaces could look differently. He created or they created for us this fantastic list of tools for us to look at our own operational spaces differently. And as a, there's all kinds of pages and all kinds of checklists. And again, send this out to people, see where they feel the the some some of the work needs to go. So don't don't you try and reimagine what needs to happen. There's your tools and get the feedback from your stakeholders for you to then try and impart, put into place some of the stop start continues. And last two slides. This is from my friend Anne Marie Luce. This is what she and her team at the Canadian International School of Beijing already started to make an ask and be able to put out to their stakeholders about what are the critical pieces that they need to look at. And so they've identified staff, health and safety, community, academics, finances and social emotional skills and then asked themselves some questions, took a look at what they need to focus on, decided what their three next steps are, and this then is what's going to drive them. It's almost like here's our missions and mission, mission and values and we're going to stick to it and this is our promise to you. And I just love the fact that it's a transition plan meaning that it's also dynamic, it also can change, it also isn't perfect. And then she sent a second slide that talks a little bit more about the questions they need to ask in order to enact this. So what are the timelines, when should they start, what do cat, what should calendars look like, what are the platforms, more of those specific pieces, those sort of extra little pieces. So I thank um, all of my fantastic friends who responded to my email to help me be able to give to you some voices in the field and just some opinions. And I know you uh, you could you could have emailed me too back all kinds of great information. Um, so of course, my last slide, I have to talk about the lobster. So this is about you, school leader. You know that lobsters are soft, mushy animals that live inside a rigid shell and their shells do not expand. So how do lobsters grow? 
as a lobster matures and it starts to feel confined and uncomfortable, it sheds its shell. And it repeats this process several times throughout their life that as they get bigger and they feel confined, they shed their shell. The stimulus for a lobster to be able to grow and change is that it's uncomfortable. And this change, this transition, this reimagining may be difficult for us, but that's okay because you're a lobster. Claws up. And lastly, last slide, please. Let me just look at it. Um, there we go. I wish you all, I think I'm right on my time, 36 minutes, which is one minute because I give it one minute. Um, I wish you all an amazing summer and rest, physicality, some meditation and some mental health and some emotional supports. Um, I wish you an unbelievable fall preparation. I wish you an exciting new educational experience. That's what this is going to be, a new experience. I will be here in the chat for the next 10 minutes to answer any questions that you have. There's other ways to reach out to me with my email, on my Twitter, I'm Principal Zed, on TikTok, I'm Dr. Zeisner, and on LinkedIn. And then if there's the link, well, there, wherever it is on here, is the link to the full in document. Please, please, please feel free to download this PowerPoint, share it widely. Um, if you see any of my friends, tell them where to go. We got on to connect Ed with Dr. Zed and they were awesome. Um, but I, this has been an honor for me to be able to talk to you and share with you. And I am with you and I see you. Anyway, I love you all very much. Bye from Spokane, Washington.